We did talk about that a little bit. Man, I want to slurpy right now. <laughs> Speaking of which, the very first time I, I ever I ever interviewed you, um, we talked about 7-Eleven and how you've never gotten any anything for free. No slurpees, nothing. Never got nothing. Not even one of those rolling hot dogs. Nothing. No. <laughs> and then the next day, someone brought you a slurpee. They did. I've actually wow, signed a pity slurpee. <laughs> Well, especially when they're, they're cold and they're wet and it's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. I, would, I could understand signing the cup and then filling it up. Yeah. But the other way around. The, Both, yeah. You have, and I, I just want to get to this real fast. You have a funny story about walking in to 7 Eleven about how. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think you're the only person I've ever told you that. Uh, yeah, it was so silly. I, I walked into 7 Eleven uh, at the height of the campaign when, when it was pretty much nationwide. And uh, I thought, well, this is going to be an opportunity to maybe get a free something. I just I wanted something for free, a little taquito, anything. And I go up to the, the guy, and I, uh, my voice is playing in the store at that moment. And I said, oh, I do that voice. And he goes, what? And I said, I do that voice. And he goes, I don't understand. And I said, oh, thank heaven. I'm that guy. I do that voice. And he goes, okay, that will be 45 cents. <laughs> I did not care. <laughs> <laughs> he, no part of that. he wanted no part of that. He just thought I was an idiot. He was, <laughs> he was absolutely right. He was like, you're, you're the fifth guy that's done that today. I'm like, I'm going to charge you to double. <laughs> don't ever come into my story. <laughs> so, um, kind of going back to your roots here, um, how how do you how did you get into voice acting? Is this something watching each other work? And so, for 26 episodes, I got to watch some of the best people in the business do their thing and steal everything they did. <laughs> and uh, it worked out. It was I, I was good enough to make it through that show, and then I was learning as as each show carried on. But I did it for fun for over a decade and stayed at that same film company. Uh, I was over 10, 12 years, something like that. And uh, then I booked the 7-Eleven campaign. And at that time, the film company was just getting to be a miserable experience. They were bringing in a lot of corporate people. And entertainment is a mean, mean business, especially in uh, feature films. And the people they were bringing in were just nasty, backbiting people. I didn't like going to work anymore. And I booked the 7-Eleven campaign, and I thought, all right, well, this is going to get me out of that job. I can do voiceover full-time, because I know that people that do commercials make millions of dollars, and I can buy a house. <laughs> so what I didn't realize was that the 7-Eleven commercials only play regional, which means instead of uh, $40,000, you get $400. Uh, but it was still okay money. I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll make this work. And then about a week later, the union went on strike, and I was out of work for uh, about a year and a half. Uh. So... Uh, Got three other jobs to support that, and still did voiceover on Sunday and on the weekends, just because I loved it and I loved the community. And uh, it was a community where we supported each other, uh, lifted each other up, made each other feel good, and safe, and confident. And I didn't get that anywhere else in my life at that time. So, so after you had your first show, did you think, okay, that's I'm done? Like nothing else is going to come of this? Oh yeah, yeah. I thought this was a fluke, and these guys were out of their minds, and they were going to play it all back. And it was going to be so terrible. They have to hire somebody else to redo it. <laughs> But it sounded okay, and they ended up having to redo that first show anyway because the sound was so terrible in that studio. It was the studio was literally built a treehouse, oh. and they called it the cave. Half the studio was backed up into this hillside, and they dug it out, and it was literally a cave. Uh, the other side was supported by a tree, so we climbed up into the treehouse to do this work every day, and uh, it wasn't soundproof. It was built for a rock band to rehearse in. And the owner of the studio thought it was a good idea that we hang by his knees upside down with a chainsaw, hacking limbs while we were working. <laughs> so half the stuff we did was unusable. We didn't know how to use the equipment properly. The engineers really weren't well versed in this kind of thing. Nobody was doing that kind of work at the time. We didn't know how to do it properly. So we ended up having to redo all of those tracks anyway. So I had another chance to do it even better. And by that time, I had some acting chops. I've yeah. done so many episodes, I learned how to do it. So. Fortunately, we were able to get a second chance at that show, which never ever happens. Uh, and I was just surprised that they brought me back in to do it. I was I was willing and able to do the creature stuff, and there weren't that many people in town that could do that. So fortunately, that's what got me in the door. And then the other stuff was just great. And then that same company just kept hiring me for years and years. And so, and so you're in the door. At what point do you finally realize, what role do you finally realize, like, oh, I think I've made it. Like, I think I've made it as a voice actor. Uh, that hasn't come yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was funny 
because it was years later after we did Cowboy Bebop, uh, many years after the show had aired, and I was at a convention. For years I didn't do conventions. I was at a convention several years later. And uh, somebody came up to me and said, wow, I, your, your acting was really great in that. Uh, you're a really great actor. And I said, well, the other people on the show are, are actors. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not really, a, I'm not a trained actor. I didn't take classical training. And Mary Elizabeth Blink, the director of the show, was sitting next to me. And she goes, what do you think you've been doing for the last 10 years? <laughs> she goes, you're an actor, you idiot. <laughs> and she said, you didn't learn it the, you know, the typical way, but you learned it uh, you know, the hard way, actually. And it, it may have made you a better actor because you did it that Appreciate way. It more. Yeah. yeah, so uh, at that point, I, I still didn't think that I made it because I couldn't make a living at it. I, I was still working several other jobs to support it. I think what really uh, sold it for me that I had made it as an actor, as a successful actor, was at a convention in uh, New Zealand many years ago. This big man came up to me, and tattoos, big intimidating guy, and uh, came up to my signing table, and he had a tear in his eye, and he was saying that uh, one of my shows affected his child in such a way that it changed his life. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my child was autistic, and he would sit in the corner and rock, and he was nonverbal for the first eight years of his life. And then one day, he shot up to the couch and his, his attention was transfixed on the TV and he said, well, what's going on? And, the, and his little boy went, shh. And it was the first real response that his son had had that was not just a grunt or some uh, body movement. And he goes, okay, cool. And he sat with him and he watched the show and it was Digimon. And the character was Gilmon. And uh, it gets, it cuts to the commercial. And the little boy who had never spoken before looks over at his father and he goes, I like this, Daddy. And he goes, what? <laughs> he speaks English. I like the show, Daddy. I like you, Mom. And the guy goes, oh my God. And so I can speak. And it was perfect English. He had been formulating these thoughts and feelings and all of a sudden just unloaded a flood of thought and emotion that had been stored up for all of his life. Uh, and this something about that show unlocked that click for him, thing in his brain, and he tells me the story, and I'm, I'm sitting there at my table, and I stand up, and I come around the table, and I just hug him, and, and we're sobbing together. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> and so, the next day, uh, I'm signing again, and about 20 people down in the line, I see this guy's head towering over above everybody else, and I wave to him, and he goes, he goes like this, and he brought the boy who's now 12 years old, and his sister and his wife, and I just stopped what I was doing in the line, I ran back there, and I hugged them all, and we're all standing there crying. Aww. And I thought, okay, I've made it. <laughs> that's, that's when I knew that I was doing something of value. And uh, it still wasn't until several years later that I was making a good living at it, I was doing okay. But for me, the success came in how these shows affected other people. And that's phenomenal that you realize that, and that you're not basing it off of uh, a specific you know, money amount or anything like that, you, you know, you know that you have touched someone's life in such a serious, serious way, and yeah. the fact that you know that, and that way is what you consider success, is, is absolutely amazing. It humbles me every time I come to one of these conventions. The stories that you guys tell me just make me cry like a baby. It's amazing. <laughs> I just can't believe, because we were, we were recording these things in a vacuum. We're in a, a padded little room by ourselves with somebody on the other side of the glass telling us what to do. Everything is out of context, but we have no idea how it's going to be consumed out there in the world. And all these years later, I hear these stories about how these shows have gotten people through hard times, or, mm -hmm. or family tragedies, or illness, or, or autism. I mean, all sorts of things that, that have just lifted people up and helped them along in their lives. And I feel like, okay, I don't, I don't have to be a, a doctor or a yeah. policeman. I can, I can still be a value out there in the world. I, I would definitely say anime probably affects people more than any other um, medium that I've ever seen, you know, yeah. like, uh, live action or anything. I, I think anime, from my friends that watch anime and everything, it, the way they talk about it and everything is just, it's, it's amazing, it's phenomenal. It's definitely um, something that's rewarding. Yeah. It's definitely going to be rewarding for you. Um, so to just jump in, you touched, you made such a, you told me such a heartwarming story, it's hard to go. I got one. Yeah. Let's talk about Star Wars. Yes, mm. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Star Wars fans are here. Woo! There's a definite star in this room. So now you are part of the Lucasfilm family. Yeah. Um, do you consider yourself part of the Disney family? 
as well? Yes. Uh, yeah, I've been a Disney fan forever, and uh, we've had a lot of input from Disney too. And, and they're great. They've been really, really great to work with. So, so you get, you find out that you're going to be in Star Wars. I mean, they probably going to say Star Wars, and you're like, yeah, whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, do it. Um, oh, it wasn't like that. It's more like, oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, I know you were a Star Wars fan growing up, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was there in 1977 for the first screenings of, of the movies. And I saw it four times in a row, and I waited in line, and it was, it was amazing. It, it changed my life back then. So what's it like to be in the Lucasfilm family now? I mean, it, is there any cool stories? Oh, uh, dude. It, just, just being in that room, working on these shows, and talking about Stormtroopers, and Darth Vader, and, and, and all the, the cool stuff that is associated with the Star Wars universe. That alone is enough. And then we get Dave Filoni walking into the room telling us about how much more important these stories are than just sci-fi entertainment. He has this global vision that it's, it is about the struggle between light and dark yeah. and good and evil and, and how all of that resides in all of us. And it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger story than some people even realize. It's, it's profound and, and moving every time I get to work on this stuff. And then I get to go up to Skywalker Ranch and stay oh. there. And I've been up to leave this film and walking through the offices, and, and that was an amazing experience. Like everybody there is a nerd, and, and they've all got all this cool Star Wars paraphernalia all over their offices. And in every room I walk into, there's there's a guy who does the lighting for the show. There's a guy who does the, uh, uh, the computer animation for it. There are illustrators, there are music people. Everybody's in this one facility. And I walk from room to room, and, and I just I needed to to decompress. Because I was swinging internally for the entire time I was in each one of these offices. It's it's a it's a overwhelming experience just to see the people creating this stuff. How much um, how much input do they let you have on the character? Uh, surprising amount. Um, most shows don't really give us that much. Uh, this show, Dave will actually say, "Well, how do you feel about this? What what do you think that would do here? I would really care about my." Personal opinion. Well, I think you should say Carabast here. <laughs> okay, cool. Give me three of those. And, and it's it's really cool. I mean, the writing is really good, and really well done, and the story arcs are very well thought out uh, before we even walk into the room. Every detail that you see in those shows is is very meticulously crafted by a, a team that really cares. And so our job is really just to go in there and not screw it up. Yeah. Um, but that said, they hired us because of certain nuances that we're bringing to those characters, and they allow us to express that uh, with every episode. So. Do you ever think that we'll see any of the Rebel characters in the actual live movies? I hope so, yeah. Well, I mean, they hinted at it, certainly, in, in uh, Rogue One. They uh, talked about uh, Commander Sabula, or General Sabula at that point, mm -hmm. uh, Hera. Uh, Chopper makes a little appearance there. Um, so we do, we are still, we see the ghosts also. Yeah. Uh, we are starting to see them bleed over, and it all connects to, so I'm, I'm hoping that some of that will carry over. And uh, nice. I, I said, well, I'm still alive, so <laughs> we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't even know what happens at the end of our series. Um, we only saw certain pieces of the script as we came in to record the last few episodes. Oh, really? And so I don't know what happens at the end. I'll be watching it along with you guys. Uh, Dave would actually, at some points, um, I would have maybe three or four lines for Zeb, and he'd hand me one page of dialogue, and I wasn't allowed to look at anybody else's scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how he's done every season. He's, he likes us to experience it as fans, too. So Is that hard to do, voice acting, when you don't know other people's roles? No, not necessarily, no, because, uh, especially because most of us are trained in the anime or in other areas where we would have to work by ourselves. Uh, so I'm used to that, and the director will give us enough context so we can deliver the lines so and the plays well yeah. with the other actors. Uh, and Dave trusts us that way, so um, it, you know he, he hires people that can do the job, and we're all very well versed in uh, playing pretend. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that isn't too hard. I want to get to some of your guys' questions. Yeah, I know you guys got questions, so I'm, I want to shut up and figure out what you guys have to say. <laughs> um, you're more than welcome to use the mic right over there if you want to go up. If you can't speak very loudly, you can go up there. If you want to just raise your hand to the seat and yell it out, you're more than welcome to. Another question. Okay, so you've done both uh, anime and American, uh, uh, you know, where, where you're dubbing and then when you, when you're like the original voice of the character. Which one do you find more difficult, like pre 
creating that character that no one's done, or like dubbing over and mouthing and timing to uh, sorry there. Can you guys hear in the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not a matter of difficulty necessarily distinguishing between the two. It's it's more character driven. Um, regarding anime, there's a technicality to that that exists that does not exist in original animation for us because we are watching what happens on screen. We're looking at the paper at the same time and we're trying to listen to the director's intention and the whole character, all of those. It's a juggling act, basically. It's a technical juggling act. But that's where I started and I'm actually really comfortable doing that. And when I'm in the room by myself, the level of concentration and focus is so laser sharp that I'm not distracted. I can do all those things at the same time. It's muscle memory at this point. Going into a room with a group of people and working it like a radio play brings an entirely different energy to it. It's not necessarily harder or easier. In fact, sometimes it could be harder because I want my performance to make their performance better too. So there's that there's that chemistry thing that we it's an, and it's a very delicate balance. I don't want to overshadow their performance. I don't want to uh, be so meek that it, it doesn't blend and it doesn't keep the characters realistic. So it's an acting exercise, no matter what you do. Acting is acting is acting. Um, personally, it's a little bit more fun for me to work with the other actors in the room, because we all become a bunch of eight-year-olds in grown-up suits. Um, <laughs> and we play. It, it's, it's really playtime. And we get, uh, it, it brings more nuance to the character, I think, when we have the input from the other people and the energy in the room. But that said, anime is my home. That's where I started. And I'll be doing that the rest of my life. And, Still pays almost exactly the same as it did 20 years ago. <laughs> so, I'm not doing it for the money, but it's, it's great to keep that skill set up too, to be able to match the lip flaps and stuff. Uh, it's, it's a very useful tool. Yeah, right there. Do you have a favorite co-star or somebody that you'll, you know, you're excited to work with and you've worked with before? Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Uh, <laughs> oh, I say her for several reasons, actually. Um, for those of you who are Bebop fans, uh, Mary was the director of Cowboy Bebop, and she played Julia. Uh, and she's now my fiance. Yeah. Uh, 20 years later, we've been friends for all these years in different relationships. Uh, we've, we've been friends, we've worked together on a lot of shows. She's Governor Price on Star Wars Rebels. Uh, she's uh, one of the greatest people I've ever met, and I, I just love working with her. She's amazing. She just directed me on another show that she's doing now. She she does mostly directing these days, but um, I have to say that she's my number one. Uh, <laughs> do I have to say that now? No, no I don't want to say that. Just a little biased. She's, no, she's, she's so cool like that. She doesn't care. And we all work with the same people, too. It's, it's hard to choose a favorite because we're all one big dysfunctional family, uh, and everybody's so good. When you're working on shows at this level, everybody's so great. It's it's fantastic to go into that room, and I like just sitting back and watching people do their thing. Uh, lately, I've been working a lot with Tom Kenny, who is you know, yes. you know, a SpongeBob, but the guy's a genius. Mm -hmm. He's a musical genius. He's he has a band. He sings. He's he's also an encyclopedia of music from the 30s and 40s and 50s. It's crazy, <laughs> just crazy. I learned I so much it. just by hanging out with him. I uh, uh, love Kevin Michael Richardson. Um, so many. Uh, Tara Strong, uh, mm -hmm. oh man, J.P. Um, Karliak, uh, oh God, I, the list is so long, you guys. Uh, Phil Lamar, uh, John yes. Maggio, yes. Uh, and all these guys, they're, they're just amazing, incredible people. Greg Griffin, um, the list is probably about 300 people long. <laughs> <laughs> so it take the rest of this panel just to go through that. But every single one of them brings so much to the party, and, and every time I'm in a room with them, they surprise me with something new. I've known a lot of these people for 10, 15 years. They'll be standing next to me, and also they'll do some crazy voice, and I went, oh my god, you did that voice? <laughs> I watched it when I was a kid. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's exactly. Really cool. So I, I can't pick a favorite. I mean, Mary is definitely the obvious choice, but, uh, mm. but everybody else is right up there. Yeah, go for it. Is Dubbing Look in L.A. Uh, union? Uh, most of it is not anymore. Yeah, it used to be. There used to be a lot of dubbing uh, work. And in terms of anime you're talking about? Yes, yeah, anime is mostly done in Texas now at, at Funimation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's non-union. Uh, it's right to work state, as you guys know. So uh, it's non-union, so there's very, very little anime that comes through LA anymore. There are a few things that come through, and, there's, and most of the rest of the anime that's in LA is non-union, just because it's, it's not even that it's cheaper, they just don't want to deal with the union, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, since you're part of the union, 
I can't do non-union dubbing. Okay. I don't do anything non union. Yeah, I haven't done anything non union in a long, long time. Uh, I only did it at the very beginning of my career. And uh, it makes me sad because there are some shows that go non union that I'd love to work on. I just can't. I'm very active in the union. And I, and I do that because I want people to have benefits. I want them to have health and retirement and, and safety. And one of the things that I've been fighting for lately is, is for vocal stress mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and video games. And many of us have gone into studios and will scream for eight hours and blow out our throats. And some people have had to have surgery. Some people have never been able to work again. So I'm fighting for those kinds of things. And the only way that we can get protection is by doing it through the union. So. Is there yeah. a lot of anime being done through Canada now, too? Uh, yeah, there's a significant amount being done through Canada. It had been done like that for many years. Also, they were trying some in Singapore for a while. They, they try to go anywhere they can to save money. Mm -hmm. but basically, that's the, the common denominator is they want to save money. And, uh, and they don't want to deal with paperwork, and they don't want to pay residuals, which they never have anyway. We have it in our contract that they're supposed to be paying residuals in 30 years of doing this. I've never seen a paycheck. Uh, for wow. residuals where they find ways to get around it. Um, so it's, it's laziness, I think, more than anything else. Uh, but there are a lot of great actors in Canada, a lot of great actors in, in Texas, of course, and some of the, the best actors in our business come from here. So. Do we have any other questions? Let's get right back here. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite character to work on? Mm. Whatever, I'm working on a Monday because I'm still employed. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I can't choose a favorite. They're, they all have a different place in my heart for different reasons. Um, Spike was probably the most transformative character. Mm -hmm. It led to Megas XLR, it led to Toonami, it led to Legend of Korra, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Samurai Shampoo, uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. <laughs> 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 uh, so Spike is probably the one that has the most profound effect like. on me, but I can't tell you how exciting it is to work on Star Wars characters. Even playing Stormtroopers is amazing for mm -hmm. me. I, I love getting slaughtered. You know, as a stormtrooper, over and over and over again. <laughs> um, Wolverine, just because it's fun to be a superhero, sort of. Gilman, uh, Digimon. Lee Ron from Gurren Lagan. When you screw it in, you give it a hard bandy twist. <laughs> <laughs> They're all fun for so many different reasons. You know, it's just, we all have multiple things in our personality, whether we're willing to admit it or not. And, and each character satisfies a little piece of that. So I, I feel like I'm a complete person by doing all the different characters. And also, I don't have to go out and hurt anybody, because all the characters are in the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, there a, is there a character voice that is hard for you to do because you laugh almost every time you do it? Uh, uh, Lee Run is one of those. Uh, do you guys know Gurren Lagan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, later on, was so funny. Um, they didn't want me to do the character in the first place. They, when I went into audition for it. They had a bunch of different characters out on the table, and they had me read for all the, the tough male characters on it. And I said, what's that one over there? And they said, oh, that's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that. No, I, I want to try it out. And they, they said, no, 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 please don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the Japanese client was there. There were four or five people there from Japan who were casting the thing. Uh, so I, I went up to the microphone. I think one of the first things I did was that line. You screwed it and give it a hard man to his time. <laughs> and then the, the, all four or five Japanese people were in the room. The director, Tony Oliver, goes, oh no. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think he wanted me to book that. And so in the sessions, Every session it became sort of a, a challenge for me to make Tony as uncomfortable as I possibly could. <laughs> he's a dear friend of mine and very, uh, he's an eloquent man. He's a Shakespearean trained actor and a great director. And he was, he's very soft spoken and, and I would just do something as, as wrong as those lines were in that show. I would take him three or four steps gnarlier. And we, we had a whole show worth of extra dialogue and I would I would bust up, he would bust up, and then I just see him go, ah. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At the end of every session we go, I I need to shower again. Oh, <laughs> so I didn't even think of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the hardest character to keep a straight face, but it really worked for it. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I, I wouldn't even guess you know, like, <laughs> Just by looking at you, how rugged you are. I'm a rugged guy. guy. I, I, I have a soft side. I have a guy. I know that now. I know that. <laughs> we all do. Admit it. Yes. <laughs> right? yeah. 
you put your hand? Yeah, um, Steve was just curious about the evolution of the Bebop movie after the series. Was there, did the series just gain so much momentum that hey, there was started to be talk around a movie, or could you talk a little bit about how the movie evolved? I honestly don't know that process. Okay. It was all done by the time it got to us. Uh, I think it was released day and date with Japan, but I, I honestly don't know. I think that was their intention to have a movie all along. But I'm not in that process. I got you. We're we're voice monkeys. We get hired after the fact. We're, we're, we're literally the last thing that goes in before it's released. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, I just did a TV show the other day, and it, I worked on the show on Wednesday, and it was going to be airing on Friday. Wow. That's how close it comes sometimes. Wow. And that movie, we were pretty up. We were pretty close up to the last minute for that too. So I have no idea uh, what their marketing strategy is or the production strategy is. Um, I'm just glad they did it, and I'm yeah. even more glad that they let me do it. <laughs> the movie was kind of a different experience. We did the series in one studio. The movie, we actually went to Sony Studios and worked in one of their big rooms wow. on the studio lot. And all the studio executives were there. It was a little more pressure working on that. In fact, um, one of the studio executives, uh, who really didn't know anything about anime at all, he just wanted his opinion uh, in, in the production of the show. And so he was walking back and forth behind me while I was recording, shouting out stuff that he thought I should do. And the director's in there going, that's not gonna match what's on the screen. He goes, I don't care, just try it. And so it was crazy. And it was really hard just to keep everything focused in for the film, but fortunately we were able to make our decisions uh, at the end, and I think it came out pretty well. Yeah, but we have no information that you guys don't. You guys probably know more about what I do than I do. <laughs> Sometimes that's true. Yeah, that's what um, so when I listen to voice actors talk, some of my favorite stories that they tell are, um, you know, you, you spoke about who you'd like to work with and who you'd like working with, but uh, sometimes I hear like who you work with who you're starstruck by. Yeah. Do you have any of those? Who you work with who just like, I can't believe I can work with them. Yeah, I've had a few of those moments. Uh, Stan Lee was a big one for me. Yeah. Uh, worked with him on a show called Superhero Squad for the first time. I've worked with Stan several times over the years. He still doesn't remember me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just walking in that room and seeing him, and, and uh, you know, I go through that, that fanboy internal squeak. I'm like, I'm creating Spider Man. I'm standing next to the creator of Spider Man. You're Spider Man's dad. <laughs> He was really, really cool. He's such a nice guy, too. And, and the thing that I love about meeting my heroes is uh, if they're nice, it, it, it just supports all of that fanboy stuff underneath. If they're not nice, I don't care to ever speak to him again. Mm -hmm. And Stan was just one of those guys. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. He's pretty dead on. Stan in his 90s. And some of the guys in, and ladies in the studio sit down when they record Stan his age would stand up and record next to us uh, the whole time. If we were there for two hours, if we were there for four hours, he was like an, an eight-year-old in an old man suit. You know? I oh, just a joy to be around. Uh, Frank Walker was another one of those. Yes. Uh, Frank, if you don't know his work, he's, he's the voice of Scooby-Doo and mm -hmm. Freddy. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also the voice of every Disney animal you've ever seen. In yes. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. He's a free willy. And he's, he's amazing. Um, awesome. Frank is, is just one of these legendary actors and, he is and best known for his creature work, but he does a million other things too. He's a great impressionist. He's a stand up comment. I worked with him on Scooby Doo and walking into that room and seeing him for the first time, I it was hard for me to even breathe, much less go up to the microphone and, and work. And uh, it was at Warner Brothers on the studio a lot. It was amazing. The whole thing was just overwhelming. And at the first break, uh, Frank came up to me and he said, you're new here. I, have, I haven't seen you on these sessions before. And I said, yeah, I'm kind of new to the original animation community. I've been doing anime for a while. And he goes, well, welcome. He stuck out his hand. We, we shook hands. And he gave me his phone number. And he said, if you ever have any problems in the community, or if you ever have a problem navigating this part of the industry, give me a call. We'll talk about it and I'll help you out. Dude, that is just amazing. It was, yeah. it was like the blessing for God or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are the people that I really, really admire. And then when I've worked with a lot of really big name on-camera actors, too. And for the most part, a lot of them really aren't great at voice acting, with some exceptions. Uh, but when they are nice people, we're all willing to help them navigate it, too. 
so that's, those are the people I really am attracted to. Mark Hamill is another one. Oh, yeah. I, I yeah. love that guy so much. I worked with him on so many different projects. And it took probably the first 15 or 20 shows that I had worked with him <laughs> on to get rid of all of that stuff. <laughs> so oh. uh, but now he's a buddy, and, and I love that man. He's, he's, he's everything he appears to be. He's just a cool guy. Yeah, right back there, sir. Yeah, uh, I really love hearing you go through uh, all of your anime voices real quick. Uh, one of my favorite characters that you ever did was actually uh, Shishio from Kenshin. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you maybe talk about that or at least say something in his voice? <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen the show. So literally all I remember about Shishio is ah! <laughs> <laughs> Pain and screaming and fire. And, uh, I was I was hoarse for a week after doing those sessions. <laughs> it was it was one of the most painful things I've ever worked on. I heard it's really cool. I heard the show is really cool. So it's, it's on my list. I have to watch it at some point. Mm. Like, I, honestly, that's all I remember. <laughs> is there any voices you do of characters that you don't do? Uh, that you yes. that you first impressions? Yeah, impressions. Uh, yeah, but here's the thing. I used to do what I thought was a really good impression of Goofy. And I put it on my answering machine when I was younger. And I told him, Marsh, look out, man! Pretty good, right? <laughs> then I knew Bill Farmer. Oh, yeah. I hit the room with him and I went, uh, no, you're my Goofy. <laughs> <laughs> I, had this, I had the same thing with Kevin Conroy, uh, for, um, who was here at the convention. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, I thought that my natural voice for him would be good for Batman, just my natural speaking voice. And I thought, you know, if, I, if I'm going to do one super heroic kind of character, that would be the guy. And then I hear Kevin's version of Batman, and I'm like, mm, no, you're not Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I'm not an impressionist. And I'll do it for fun. We do, we do some things called Twisted Tunes at some conventions yes. where a bunch of voice actors uh, get up on stage and we'll uh, read scenes from really well-known movies, Back mm -hmm. to the Future, or something from Star Wars or whatever, and we do them in our stupid character voices. And then I get to play. Then I'll do it my version of Goofy, and it's going to be yeah. a terrible version. Yeah. I do like this thing that they call Filthy Elmo. It's not for this room. So then I'll, yes, I'll take those impressions and I'll use them there. But generally, when when I have impressions that I do, there are other people that do them so well. I'm not going to do it any better. I'm going to do it differently. And even if I get called to uh, voice a character that somebody has voiced before, I'll call them and I'll say, why aren't you doing this? And if there's a, a good reason or if they're okay with it that I audition for it or I put the role, Starscream is a great example. Charlie Adler was doing Starscream's voice in the movies. And uh, I called him because I booked uh, the voice of Starscream for uh, Transformers Prime. And I said, Charlie, are you okay with this? What's happening? Why aren't you doing this? You're my Starscream. He goes, no, there's a bunch of reasons, political and otherwise, that I can't do it right now. So go ahead, enjoy it, have a great time. But, but we'll do that for each other. I don't, I've never been of the mindset that I want to take somebody else's job. You need that blessing first. You know? Absolutely, yeah, and for, for all the new aspiring voice actors out there who do impressions, keep that in your toolbox, it's a great thing to have, but know that the fact that you're doing an impression means that somebody's doing, doing that voice now. And you don't want to go after their work. Incorporate that into something else that you do. Maybe smash a couple of them together, and then you've got a brand new character that's unique to you. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage that. Do we have any other questions? We have just a couple minutes left. Yeah, right over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Transformers Prime. What was it like to play Starstream with, you know, uh, Peter Cullen and Frank Walker? <laughs> Absolutely delicious. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, very painful. <laughs> where fanboy squee, um, I remember Peter walking into the room for the first day of recording. And I had known Peter before. We both worked on Tsunami. I'd seen him in the studios before. But I'd never seen him do Optimus Prime before. And he walks into the room. He's this, he's this really well put together, old Hollywood looking gentleman with a pencil mustache and very well dressed, mm -hmm. very soft spoken, very nice and quiet. And he would go up to the microphone, and he's a smoker, so he'd go up to the microphone and go through all that at first. And then all of a sudden, you just go, okay, you ready? Transform robot. <laughs> <laughs> the walls would flex. All of our bones were vibrating. <laughs> all of these trained professional actors in the room would kind of go, okay, oh, 
<laughs> and it was crazy. It was just crazy. And then he and Frank would go into their stories, their old buddies, and uh, Optimus and Megatron mm. together. It was it was everything you could possibly imagine and more. And the talent level in that room was so great anyway. Every single person in that room was, was so much fun to watch and listen to that at times I would get so um, uh, distracted watching their performances that I would forget to go up to the mic to do my <laughs> uh, It was great. And then when I went to do, uh, when I would do Starscream, they took uh, too much pleasure in my pain. <laughs> so if you notice, as the episodes progressed, Starscream would get into more and more trouble and scream a lot more. Yeah. They loved that. After the first few episodes, they realized that I could do the girly scream. The uh, executive <laughs> producer came into the room uh, after one of the sessions and he goes, by the way, we love when you go into that high-pitched screamy thing, and we're going to give you a cue from now on, so when you see this, I want you to take it up. So to see a bunch of studio executives from Hasbro in, in suits on the other side of the glass doing jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than willing to take it from here. <laughs> it, was, it was the most ridiculous room. <laughs> a lot of people I in that room were, uh, they had worked on the old G1 stuff too, and so it was, it was faithful to the fan base. They wanted it to be good for you guys, and we were terrified. We didn't know if you guys would accept it. It was a different animation style and uh, just different models. I mean, Starscream was the model for Starscream is so different than what he had ever looked like before. We thought that, you know, there might be some big haters out there, and there were, but finally they accepted me the eels, so it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was super fun, though. Super. We miss it a lot. So try to get one more question in. Right back here, the young lady. Um, what's the difference oh, yes. you can get your boys? <laughs> the deepest? Yeah. Uh, Probably, I, uh, I go pretty deep with um, Ridlock Brimstone from uh, Guild Wars 2 or uh, Grunt from Mass Effect. Yes! But then they pitch it down from there, so they want it inhumanly deep. So for something like Grunt, I'll go um, straight to the face, Shepard. <laughs> 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 then they'll pitch it down so it, it just rumbles everything. Um, I've gone deeper than that. If it's if it's an early morning and I've had a rough night before, it will actually go deeper than that. I can, I, can go, I can drop it pretty down into the bass, but it's, it's hard to sustain that and to make it uh, intelligible. It just sounds like a bunch of bass rumble in a club. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty rough. You've had your hand up for a long time, right? I don't want to miss that. At the expense of Naruto attacking you, um, <laughs> how, how, uh, how was the, the Rochimaru uh, role? Rochimaru was... Also delicious. <laughs> when you're looking for bodies to inhabit, you can't help but think about how satisfying that is on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> not even nervous over here. It's like, not at all. There's a little Naruto here who's about to cut me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. Daddy, you're afraid. You don't have to be afraid. I'm just an old dude who makes stupid voices. <laughs> but the best voices. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. All right, Steve. I want to thank you for coming out here. And I, I got to say something personally. So ever since I was a kid, I wanted to do one thing is that entertain people. Um, when I was younger, I would lock myself into the bathroom and I would pretend I have my own like Tonight Show situation. I right? always wanted to introduce the and entertain people. Earlier this year, I got to live that dream, and you were the first person I ever got to interview, so you will always hold a special place in my heart. So if you go on Facebook and look that up, we're going to be opening that up for anybody that's interested in voice acting, whether you want to go into it or not, it's all free in there, and then we're going to have a bunch of free stuff uh, that will be available. If you want to take it to the next level, we'll actually have webinars that are available online, and uh, we'll be doing them uh, twice a month. It's going to be really affordable, and 
uh, it's, it's sort of my answer to all the predators out there that want to take your money and promise you a bunch of stuff that they can't deliver. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to be bringing a bunch of guest stars and things. It's going to be really fun. So if you're interested in that, stop by my sign-in table and I'll have a little sign-up sheet. Or you can just go online to Blue Box Community on Facebook and, and sign up there and we'll flood you with a bunch of really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Uh, well, the Blue Box Community is up now. It's, okay. it's up and running. My, my son is, is managing that whole site. We, we opened it uh, to, two days ago, and there's like a thousand people in there now. Wow. But it's, wow. it's a great community where we can all support each other, too. And uh, we don't allow any bullying, we don't allow any judgment in there. It's just people that want to have fun and uh, are interested in voice acting and want to share their stories, too. That's awesome. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a cool venue to do that, where it's, it's safe for everyone. It's safe, and we want to you know keep everybody's confidence levels high and help people get through tough stuff. Mm. So that's important. Yeah. What are you going to do to kind of uh, right after this, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're we're gonna gonna sit right back over there tomorrow too. Yeah. All right, everybody, please give a round. Of Thank you. Guys.